Good afternoon. And actually, we have people joining from all over the world. So good evening, good morning, uh, depending on your time zone. Um, this is the third lecture of the academic year and second of the semester as part of the um, Iowa State University College of Design 2022-2023 academic year lecture series. Uh, I'm Peter Zerowesti. I'm an associate professor of practice in the Department of Architecture and a member of the um, College of Design Lecture and Exhibitions Committee that works with our amazing support staff and student groups to put this series together. Um, before we get started today, we would like to begin with a land acknowledgement. Iowa State University and the College of Design are located on the ancestral lands and territory of the Bakoji or Iowa Nation. The United States took this land from the Meskwaki and Sauk Nations in the Treaty of 1842. The university wishes to recognize our obligations to this land and all the people who have cared for it, including the 17,000 native people who live in Iowa today. And uh, beyond the kind of boilerplate lip service form that these statements sometimes take, um, the committee this year really focused on bringing in folks um, that are reckoning with and grappling with um, design disciplines that have legacies in oppression and exclusion, and instead introducing new forms of design thinking that are interested in inclusion and care. Um, in uh, the fall, November, we have Alana Farhi. Lalani is a uh, Canadian, a Canadian lawyer and activist. She spoke to us about planning for the future using human rights and housing. Um, and March 1st, we had Brian Hurd come to Ames um, and he spoke to us about justice, equity, diversity and inclusion and in planning and design. Um, Brian's deeply engaged as a regional leader um, with an emphasis on St. Louis. Um, today, we're very grateful to have Justin um, join us from Berlin. Uh, Shelby is going to introduce him in more detail, but suffice to say, we're thrilled to have Justin today. Um, uh, Guillermo Galindo is joining us March 29th for a lecture and on the 30th for a performance. Um, Guillermo is a post-Mexican composer, artist, and performer, uh, uh, describes uh, himself as a sonic architect, and he'll be um, uh, introducing ideas of redefining the boundaries of music composition, sound and visual art performance, spirituality and activism. Our last lecture is from Cheryl Ann Simpson on April 12th. Cheryl Ann is an assistant professor at Carleton University in Canada, and she's interested in uh, migration, place and citizenship. The title of her talk is Abolition and Digital Citizenship, The Wash. So this, this, this series, the way that it works is um, student groups, faculty and staff actually submit nominations and the committee just curates that list um, and, and shortlists it and invites folks to come speak. So uh, the series is really a product of the engagement of, of y'all, the, the audience. So um, Sailor is going to copy paste a link into the chat and um, Folks from the College of Design can follow that link and submit a form and tell us who you'd like to bring to the college. Um, today, um, uh, Shelby is going to give an introduction to Justin and his work. Justin will then um, give the lecture. We'll have 15 minutes of roundtable with Shelby and Cruz Garcia, um, who are both associate professors here in the Department of Architecture, and then we'll wrap up with uh, a question or two from the audience. So with no further ado, I'll hand it over to Shelby. All right. Thank you, Peter. Um, so again, my name is Shelby Doyle. I'm an associate professor of architecture. So I wanna say thank you to Peter and the entire lecture and exhibitions committee for organizing this talk when it's an honor to have Justin here today. I um, threw his hat into, or my his name into the hat uh, about a year ago and was just wishful thinking. It was like, maybe he'll come. Um, so it's really delightful to have Justin here. I'm going to keep the, um, he has a really extensive list of accolades and accomplishments. So I'll share an abbreviated overview so we can get to his talk. But Moore's work at the Mellon Foundation focuses on advancing equity, inclusion, and social justice through place-based initiatives and programs, built environments, cultural heritage projects, and commemorative spaces and landscapes. He has extensive experience in architecture planning and design from urban systems, policies, and building projects to grassroots and community-focused planning, design, preservation, public realm, and arts initiatives. 
He was the executive director of the New York City Public Design Commission, where he spearheaded initiatives to address social equity and sustainability through improved built environment, design, and public processes. His work spanned housing and community development, place and open space design, historic preservation, public art and monuments, and civic engagement. Moore holds a Bachelor of Design from the University of Florida and a Master of Architecture and Master of Science and Urban Design degrees from Columbia University, where he now serves as an adjunct associate professor of architecture. He has taught at Morgan State University, Tuskegee University, and the Yale School of Architecture. He is a member of the American Institute of Certified Planners, the National Organization of Minority Architects, the Urban Design Forum, and Black Space. He received the American Academy of Arts and Letters Award in Architecture and was named to the United States Commission of Fine Arts by President Joe Biden. So without further ado, let's please welcome Justin Garrett Moore. Great, thank you so much, uh, Shelby and Peter, and of course to uh, Cruz, uh, partner in crime, and uh, to Phil, uh, uh, joining from Montreal, and, and thank you all uh, for taking some, some time to hear uh, about some of my work. Uh, so I will share screen. And hopefully uh, you all can see that. Um, so I wanted to uh, frame this talk around uh, questions about architectures and care and to thread that through some of the work that I'm doing in my role, not only as an architect, urban designer, urban planner, uh, but also someone that's working in a particular position of power and agency in that I now work for the Mellon Foundation uh, for about two years now uh, in a program called Humanities in Place, where our prompt and the, the subtitle of this talk is on keeping and shaping our places. Uh, and so this new program that I've been leading is the first new program at the foundation in over 30 years. Um, and uh, program area is a, a way that the foundation gives away its funding and resources in order to uh, redirect action in, in how uh, place and lives and, and powers are distributed. But this prompt of care, I wanted to first start with, with a, a, a quote from uh, Bernice Fisher and Jerome Tronto, a, a famous um, uh, sort of feminist uh, 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 advocates thinking about ethics um, and their sort of feminist theory of care. And it says, on the most general level, we suggest that caring be viewed as a species activity that includes everything that we do to maintain continue and repair our world so that we can live it in as well as possible. That world includes our bodies, ourselves, and our environment, all of which we seek to interweave in a complex life-sustaining web. And so there's prompt about care, but the intersections as it connects to our bodies, ourselves, and our environment is something that I want to talk uh, really across this talk about because it is explicitly talking about the value and role that architects and designers, you know, people who are concerned with uh, the shaping or the, the uh, kind of manipulation or stewardship of the environment with our bodies and ourselves and the selves being both us as individuals, us as communities and, and us kind of the multitude of people globally, uh, those uh, to whom we're responsible to. And I'm uh, giving this talk uh, uh, tonight from Berlin, Germany, where we've uh, just come from seeing uh, concentration camps, uh, right? And, and uh, uh, the architecture of the inverse, uh, where they're building designs and plans to do exactly the opposite of all these things. And it's important to kind of understand the entire uh, kind of spectrum of activities and what our responsibilities in that space might be. Uh, but in our, our work at the, the foundation, and the, the Mellon Foundation is led by uh, Dr. Elizabeth Alexander, poet, uh, scholar, uh, who's done an incredible range of work talking about our values, our humanities, um, our, our kind of exchanges and interactions in the world, and, and what are the ways that we can do that work. And so in our program, we have three prompts, uh, one, keep and shape our places, to evolve our institutions and three, promote greater engagement and understanding. And I'll uh, outline this a little bit more for you what that means. 
Uh, and so we partner with a wide range of people, histories, organizations, and ideas uh, to think about how uh, we can keep in shape place, right? So that can include people like architects, but it also can include people like playwrights. Uh, and it's important to, to think about who has agency in the work of shaping the built environment. And that's because history is really all around us. Uh, our knowledge and experience are all around us. Uh, and future generations won't learn uh, the lessons about uh, our sites, our histories, how we connect and relate, uh, but also about who the people are, uh, how people have lived, how people dream, how they uh, think and, and operate in different ways. And so the gentleman on this uh, slide is August Wilson. He was one of a um, uh, 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 really important playwright in American history, in African-American history. And this uh, site where you see him uh, in 1999 before he died, uh, this is where he grew up uh, in Pittsburgh's Hill District. And so this was the site where he grew up and he became quite famous. And he returned to this site again and again uh, that had shaped him. Uh, but it also had shaped his work and thought about that this space can and should be a hub for people to be inspired, to think about their humanity, to think about their communities, and, but also as a place, as a creative hub for artists and writers to be uh, nurtured and inspired. And so today with uh, the support of our, our program, uh, the August Wilson House is really investing in the idea of place and story and the power of it uh, in, in order to make uh, people like August Wilson's dreams reality, right? That it's possible to uh, kind of think and imagine a uh, place. So the, the, the backyards that, that shaped his uh, body of work could be reimagined and redesigned uh, to be more just and more equitable. And so when we talk about uh, the ways that we support the innovative ideas and actions that we design a more just present and future landscape, this project is one example. And so this home's uh, renovated backyard landscape was designed by Black landscape architect, uh, Walter Hood. Um, what's really incredible about this project, although it's sort of uh, small and contained in a way, is that it creates a place for performances and community gatherings uh, for people to share, amplify, and reinterpret August Wilson's work, but also to create a new platform for writers, playwrights, artists, uh, performers, and, and kind of uh, agents of all kinds that are doing the work of shaping and retelling um, American stories and stories of that place and community. And so it's important that we think about how built projects, right, built environmental projects, architecture, landscape architecture, urbanism, like what's being done here with the August Wilson House, is at the intersection of knowing that racial justice and spatial justice are linked, so that communities like uh, the Hill District uh, uh, which was a predominantly African-American district, right? A place that was redlined, a place that saw urban renewal, a place that saw all of the systematic harms of the society can be rethought. It can be kept, that history can be kept, but it also can be reshaped uh, in order to think about how we redesign, rearticulate space and reinvest in place with a justice framework in mind uh, in our work. Another example um, that I wanted to share is, is uh, more of a, a, a project at the intersection of arts and, and preservation. Uh, and at the foundation, we're able to provide different types of support. Uh, and so in this case, uh, we were able to provide support for the acquisition of, of a site and, and investing in uh, the work needed to actually keep the space. And so this is uh, the childhood home of Nina Simone in Tryon, North Carolina. Uh, there's an artist-led preservation initiative uh, that receives support from the National Trust for Historic Preservation's Action Fund in partnerships with the site's owners, which is called Daydream Therapy LLC. And so Daydream Therapy LLC uh, includes artists such as Adam Pendleton and Julie Moretu, uh, among others, who came together with the idea that this important space needed to be saved and protected, but also as a generative space for artists. And so some of the images here are work that the artists, working with community members and designers and architects, landscape architects, are rethinking and shaping what uh, this important site might become as a new way to steward Nina Simone's legacy 
but also develop a, a, a reinvention and, and innovation uh, for how that home could be used in the future and provide opportunities for both the authenticity of Nina Simone and her story and her space, uh, but also the ability to provide a new platform for people like visitors uh, to this community, like artists who may want to connect with her work, uh, both music um, performance artists, but also visual artists through uh, the reimagine of this space. So it's a conversation about the power of vision, the power of design to take places that are underinvested and to think about uh, how we use our uh, spatial tools, our operational tools, our tools for care, right? All of the different activities between our bodies, ourselves, um, and, and our environment in order to make a space. And so concepts such as whether we do uh, a prompt around and, right? Sort of adding uh, to space or balancing decisions like, uh, do you add HVAC systems to this old historic home to make it habitable for today's uh, creature comforts or do you keep it in its original integrity uh, and provide other sorts of spaces to uh, modernize uh, the facilities. So a lot of interesting design questions come up when you're talking with artists, when you're talking with people in the community about what the vision, what the purpose of the place would be, what the purpose of the space would be, uh, but also again, what its power and agency are, right? What is the authentic story? How do you let the ground speak in the work? All the while that they're developing this, they're talking about the program, right? So in, in architecture school, right, you program space, right? And you're trying to reconcile those things. There's so much generative work with the program itself. So talking about how artists would be able to connect to the space, uh, uh, thoughtfully engaged uh, is important here. But something that is also key in this project is that it's a project located in the South, uh, in, as I mentioned, Tri North Carolina, and there's a broader network of stories and connections that have to be understood. And so in this project, there is the home, but there are also the full set of places, both private and public and uh, kind of semi-private that shaped Nina Simone and acknowledging that there's a larger infrastructure, places like the public library, places like uh, the local theater, and understanding that, a, that there are a series of spaces that have shaped uh, this person's life beyond uh, only uh, the home. So not uh, too far from, from there in North Carolina, you all probably have known and, and seen this project many times. This is in the Black Belt region of Alabama. Uh, and this was a project that Mass Design did. Uh, Mellon did fund this project uh, back in 2018 uh, for the Peace and Justice uh, Memorial Center and the National Memorial for Peace and Justice uh, by the Equal Justice Initiative in Montgomery, Alabama. Very often it's called the lynching a memorial in, in shorthand to acknowledge the history of racial terror in the United States and how that's connected to that particular place there in Montgomery, but also a broader American landscape and, and the connections to that. And again, relationship between our body, ourselves, and our environment. But this is, is an important story to be invested in and told, and absolutely will do that, but there are other um, stories that need to be uh, understood. So in that same region of the Black Belt, not too far from, from Montgomery, um, is Egan Nifalija. Uh, and this is a 1,200-acre intentional eco-village of the indigenous Muscogee descendants. So after 180 years of having been forcibly removed from their traditional homelands in what is now colonially known as Alabama, they have returned to, for the purpose of practicing linguistic, cultural, and ecological sustainability. The major impetus of the establishment of Egan Nifalija is the revitalization of the Muscogee language, which is classified as definitely endangered by UNESCO. Their ancient yet threatened language is a cultural gateway to the traditional, to their traditional worldviews, cosmology, medicine, and ceremonies. They use this language in these sort of prompts as a way to extrapolate their knowledge through linguistic reflection, uh, equipping them with the social and ethical lenses and practical management tools uh, that are required to become eff effective stewards of their people, uh, their community, their place, uh, and ultimately a planet. 
And so uh, uh, through our support at Mellon, uh, we were able to provide a, a three and a half million dollar grant to Egan Ifalija for their new Alahogi project, which will provide space for hosting retreats, meetings, spiritual gatherings, and educational and professional activities uh, for the indigenous community that is returning uh, from kind of a diaspora, right? They were relocated to places like uh, Oklahoma and Kansas, et cetera, to return to what were their native homelands um, and for people to have that space and opportunity uh, for their practices and ways of living, but also then to provide a, an intersection with uh, people to learn about the culture, to expand um, uh, who has uh, kind of understanding and access to it. And just as an illustration of kind of the importance of this, I'd like uh, to hear uh, quickly from, from uh, Muskogee people in their own words about their vision for the place. Alahogi is intended to connect visitors to the local ecology, to each other, to introduce guests to our Muskogee cultural values, and to help foster good stewards of the natural world. Right, so it's, it's, it's a shame, right, that that language is so unfamiliar, but it's something that we think is important. And so I'll share a reflection from a Diné artist and community organizer, Lila June Johnson, who had the opportunity to visit this in, in, is, and experience this important place. Quote, visiting Egan Yifalija made me realize that all my life as a Diné woman, I have never truly known what it feels like to be in an indigenous space, a space beyond reservations, border towns, white owned towns and cities. The expansiveness of hundreds of acres of pure indigenous Renaissance that answers to no one except the prayers and values of our ancestors is a truly liberating feeling. A place that we can truly call our own without colonial guidelines or stipulations. I felt for the first time what it is like to be free to be indigenous. We need more people to fill this and we need more places like this. So it's an important uh, sort of understanding to talk again about the idea of how do you care and steward a place? How do you keep um, a, a space and a culture, but also understanding these important connections to environment, other ways of knowing, other ways of building, other ways of interacting in space. And this is something that uh, we're able to support. So, uh, you know, that's sort of one branch of work, these sort of direct built environment projects, but there are multiple types of work that we're engaged in, right? It, it took multiple types of work, multiple types of resources, labor, et cetera, to kind of create the world that we're living in today, although it's not a, um, a fully just world, it took a lot of work to create it. It also takes a lot of different types of work to transform, to shift, or to undo and repair some things about our world. So our second prompt of work at, at Mellon Humanities in Place is what we call evolving our institutions. And so this uh, includes supporting and developing organizations and fields of practice, uh, institutional structures, educational structures, uh, et cetera. One of the fields that uh, we all know needs significant uh, evolution is historic preservation. This is because the preservation field remains predominantly and stubbornly white and male. And its established institutions and practices from the academy to architecture have for generations centered and primarily valued white and Eurocentric histories and spaces. So our funding last year to the grassroots and Latina led organization, Latinos and Heritage Conservation acknowledges that the preservation field must change. Their work like the Abuelas project shown here elevates Latinx history, heritage and culture and brings new yet rooted perspectives, leadership, and communities to the important work of defining the present and future of the preservation and cultural heritage fields. And so with the resources that we were able to provide from uh, Humanities in Place, uh, they were able to resource not just you know, their programs and, and um, things that are easy to fund, but actually their organizational capacity. As I mentioned, it was Latina led, so we were able to fund uh, the, those Latina women who are doing this important heritage and care and uh, uh, stewarding work to be able to dedicate their time and resources and energy to that work, uh, right, without having those dynamics. 
And so they're developing this work as a network uh, to, to develop this space. Um, so, you know, the tangible uh, kind of built environment work, the kind of institutional and kind of network work. And then there's another branch of work that we call uh, promote greater engagement and understanding. And this is really about the people, uh, the lives uh, that all of our work intersects. And so uh, this branch of our work is really to help people learn about themselves and their communities and uh, really their, their broader world. So founded by an unemployed artist in 2020 during the COVID-19 lockdown, the Sock Box Presents, shown here, presents itself and uh, prides itself in energizing public spaces with community. And so here you see one of uh, uh, their melon-funded performances, uh, which is focused on poetry on Manhattan's Duke Ellington Circle, which connects the neighborhoods of Harlem and East Harlem. And I really love this photo because it perfectly illustrates two things that the Soapbox Presents does so well bring people together and claim space for people who are too often silenced and to do that in public. Uh, and here's a video of one of their Stoop Sessions uh, events uh, in her room. Let me tell you about a gal I know. She is my baby and she lives next door. Every morning for the sun comes up. She makes the coffee in my favorite cup. That's how I know. Yeah, I know. Hallelujah, I just love her so. Come here, sister. Papa's in the swing. Ain't you here now? Got that new green, baby. So this group uses the power of the arts, history, and culture to boldly proclaim, proclaim that the humanities are all around us, out in public, on a busy street, on the apartment stoop, a sidewalk median, and that it's everywhere. And so if we think about how this work is everywhere and how it belongs to all of us, it's important that we acknowledge that we all have a right and even an obligation to make our voices heard in the public square. And this is all, of, again, about how you connect people to their place and their environment and that it's really a collective act. It's an act of the multitude. Uh, and as uh, my uh, uh, Abney, the, the founder just said, community is not a place you go, it is something you do. And so that uh, acknowledgement that there's a sort of action verb, right? That community and place uh, have an action, it has an activity, right? The, the series of activities uh, that create space is something that we're conscious of. So that gives you sort of an idea about uh, some of the spectrum of work that we're doing from, uh, you know, something like a, a landscape by Walter Hood um, in Pittsburgh Hill District to uh, 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 intentionally, historically anchored block party in Harlem. There are a lot of different types of engagements that we think about people in design. So in the program uh, that I've been leading in, in about two years, we've made uh, over 120 grants uh, to 110 grantees with uh, over $112 million uh, distributed. Uh, so it's a significant amount of resources going to this work. Our program is quite distinct in that uh, one of the reasons the numbers are so large is that we're able to do capital projects. So people buying land, building buildings, uh, doing uh, uh, the range of work that includes architecture and, and built environment fields. 
Something that's important is that uh, three quarters of our grantees are people that are completely new to the Mellon Foundation. Mellon is uh, really a legacy uh, grant maker, so connected to large universities, cultural institutions, museums, et cetera. Many of our, our grantees are smaller community-based organizations, grassroots groups, uh, or even kind of smaller uh, local governments. Uh, and nearly a, a third uh, of our grants uh, are really coming from outside sources, people that are just sending an email and, and <laughs> asking to see if they can get support uh, and that we're open to those wide range of organizations. And so we talk about, um, I'm sorry, there's a weird thing on the title there. Uh, the, the types of grants that we're making that what we call cultural lenses and frameworks is, is something that we're really focused on. And what that means is uh, things that are focused on the lived experience of various demographic groups, such as Black, Indigenous, Latinx, immigrant, Asian, LGBTQIA plus communities. Uh, but we're also thinking about things like artist-led initiatives, built environment projects, uh, preservation and conservation efforts uh, as well. Uh, and we're all across uh, the country and even uh, one spot in, in uh, Ghana, or actually there's two projects in Ghana, Accra, the African Futures Institute, uh, led by Leslie Loco, uh, and uh, the W.B. Du Bois uh, Museum, which is also located in Accra in Ghana, uh, which is the final resting place of W.B. Du Bois. Uh, but this national footprint uh, really shows that this work about place is about our places, right? So we're everywhere from uh, the Bay Area to Boston and from Arizona to Accra. Um, we have a broad reach and and uh, kind of across the map, but we also go deeper in places like Baltimore, Chicago, or the Black Belt that I mentioned earlier, uh, or the Gulf or, or Gullah Geechee Coast. Uh, and since uh, we launched this work, we really heard from our grantees, right, the people that we're supporting and working with, uh, that they're really interested in, obviously, their work, social justice, spatial justice, uh, what we call uh, remembering our, our memories, um, you know, thinking about the importance and power of narrative and story in place uh, in order to see more just uh, communities is something that needed a network, right? It needed the opportunity for exchange. And so when we talk about who we're supporting and who we're bringing together in coalition uh, uh, to do this work, this is a, an image from a recent convening that we had of our various grantees. Uh, people from many different fields and backgrounds. There are, you know, there are lots of architects and <laughs> landscape architects and preservationists and urbanists uh, in this crowd and academics and scholars in this crowd. Uh, but we've also got uh, Leona Tate, uh, who uh, was the first uh, Black, uh, at the time, girl to integrate the public schools in New Orleans. Uh, and she's been doing work of advocacy, talking about the intersections of justice space, community, and education uh, for decades and is now able uh, to get some support to do that work and to, to help reach broader public audiences. Um, so we have a wide range of, of people, again, who we call the multitude, right? We don't say it's the diversity or anything, right? This is the multitude. These are uh, kind of the complete um, uh, picture of all the people uh, that we need to value. And so we were able to have spaces for, for conversation, for people doing different types of work, right? So the Soapbox presents a leader speaking with the, the leader of Latinos in Heritage Conservation uh, or the leader of the August Wilson House, uh, but also to provide spaces for different conversations. Where are there the difficulties? Where are the challenges, resource challenges, um, burnout, um, uh, thinking about how people communicate effectively with their audience and having space to understand uh, that there are many layers uh, to this work. But throughout all of these conversations that we had about our work and we're asking, you know, what is this work about? What are, what are you doing? We've heard that obviously history is important, that culture is important, uh, storytelling and place is key. But first and foremost, everyone is noting that their work is about human connection. Right, so if we talk about care, and when there is a breakdown in care, it's often because of a lack of human connection. Right, that 
that that there are gaps. Again, I'm here in <laughs> in Berlin, uh, and you know that is was a fundamental issue, right? The 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 disconnect uh, in acknowledging people's humanity. And so we asked people what what they think you know all this collective work is, and they said it was calling people in to learn and to connect people with place, knowledge, art, culture, history, and most importantly, each other. And this is something that we, in our work, think about in terms of what is the power and agency of, for example, architecture or landscape architecture or urban design, right? It's important, most importantly, it's that ability through space, which is very tangible, uh, to make it so that people are connected to each other and that that is done in a way that is allowing people to, to live as well as possible uh, to have exchange. So uh, I, I wanted to share another uh, kind of few examples of uh, you know the spatial dimension of this work, spatial programmatic intersection dimension of this work. Uh, so I wanted to highlight uh, some work that we're doing uh, around theaters. Uh, so, you know, back when I was in architecture school, you always, by the time you graduate, you design at least one theater, uh, even though like very few people actually design theaters uh, in architectural practice, but uh, that used to be a thing. Um, uh, but theaters are this really important uh, type of space because I think it forces you to think about content. It forces you to think about program and, and public and, and sort of scale in a different way. And so one of the things that we've supported in Humanities in Place is to think about theaters as platforms for community power. And so the example shown here is, is the theater offensive, uh, and it has seen significant programmatic support from Mellon over the years. Mellon is, is uh, the nation's largest arts and culture funder. They give away half a billion dollars a year, a year to the Humanities, Arts, and Culture. And so we've, we've funded things like arts groups like uh, the theater offensive. And so that organization's work is uh, centering LGBTQIA plus communities and their stories, and it's very much tied to their place in Boston uh, and, and the gay and uh, LGBTQ uh, community in Boston. And so Mellon support for that arts organization needed to translate at some point into supporting actually building out a space. And so uh, the theater and performing arts are important and powerful tools for storytelling and for social justice, but also uh, the idea of having and keeping and controlling space that allows for that community to continue to be in place, to continue to be present and to be a, an important and connected a part of the society, frankly, in a neighborhood that's seeing a lot of gentrification, redevelopment, and the erasure of that community in place. And so our support for this organization uh, help them to do so. Um, another example is uh, the Victoria Theater in St. Paul, Minnesota. Uh, and this project would help revitalize a long vacant theater in the city's predominantly uh, BIPOC and immigrant community. And so that community, uh, which is called Frogtown, uh, Frogtown Rondo in St. Paul has seen generations of racialized inequality from redlining and urban renewal and, and highway construction, the highway you know, just a few blocks off of this path. Uh, to today, they're facing uh, contemporary gentrification pressures, and so in this project, uh, our support is uh, able to allow this arts and and activism and, and so justice focused activism organization that was able to acquire this building to uh, stabilize it and renovate it uh, and redesign it ultimately as a much needed community space you know, as a theater, right, for arts and culture and, and those types of programs, but also as a community space and anchor for different types of social and community connection activities. And you'll see in the image here, there, there's artwork in the board, uh, in the, the storefront um, uh, windows. And this site, uh, because it's a Black community in St. Paul, was effectively a headquarters for activism uh, following the murder of George Floyd, which was just across the river in Minneapolis. Uh, and so there were uh, demonstrations, protests, et cetera, in this community. And this theater space, this kind of community anchor, uh, became an important space for that activism and acknowledgement of the the, the present Black um, and, uh, uh, in this case, also immigrant communities that were affected by things like uh, the police state uh, and, and democide and, and kind of 
repeated harm by the state on uh, certain communities, that this uh, theater also provided a space uh, for organizing and safety and care uh, for the communities that were negatively impacted. In uh, Oklahoma City, similar forces of inequality have nearly erased an entire community. In this uh, image, it, it, I, it's an incredibly powerful image. Uh, it's of the Jewel Theater, which is uh, the only historic theater uh, left in that community. It was built in 1931 for Hathel and Percy James, which is an African-American uh, theater owners. And uh, it's the only thing that remains on a, what was a once vibrant Black business corridor. And so today, Oklahoma City's Black community members are working together to revitalize this important Black space. Uh, and so let's hear from them now. This is the only Black theater uh, remaining in Oklahoma City. Living as close as I did to the 4th Street, my parents would always allow me to come down here to the theater. At the time, there were all sorts of businesses down here. Not just the theater, there was cleanuses, uh, shoe shine stands, pool halls, uh, restaurants. So there was a lot of activity on 4th Street at the time. I remember going here um, when I was younger. Um, Dad would give us like about 35 cents, we'd get soda and popcorn. Um, until the theater closed. The person that ran the movie at the theater at the time that I was coming down here was Clint Newton. So over the years, I got to know him and his wife well. And after the movie, the theater closed, I purchased the theater from him in the late 70s. And I've had it ever since. The Jewel Theater is a Black cultural asset here in the Northeast Oklahoma City community. Oops. Sorry about that. This is the only Black theater. Yeah. Being erased from the built environment. Black Space Oklahoma is a collective of planners and architects, designers, community activists, people who are really passionate about Black community spaces and really telling these stories, preserving the history, and making sure that Black projects are supported in our community. We wanted to come alongside and support Mr. Hearst, the owner of the Jewel Theater, to allow Mr. Hearst to realize that dream uh, of restoring this property and then letting it itself become another catalyst for development along this corridor. The challenge is a lot of people don't know that this building is here. A lot of young black people don't know that this building is here. It's, it's a challenge getting there. I grew up right here, driven down the street several times. Um, I never knew what this was. I never got to see it open in its glory. And as a filmmaker here in Oklahoma City, it would be massively cool to be able to premiere films here. Um, I could see this space being used for multiple things, um, really, Black excellence being on display here. So this is a, a, another important example, an example of when, you know, when I talk about this idea of, of care. So you saw that image at the very beginning and even this image here that talks about how the built environment expresses the conditions that our uh, society is forced on certain people, communities, environments, uh, et, et cetera. That has difference in a negative way, sort of expressed in, in the built environment and, and kind of its care and stewardship. But this example is wonderful because Mr. Hurst featured in this vid video, right? That, that image of the rest of that entire neighborhood being destroyed and, and this uh, man and his family have been able to keep and protect uh, that building from the, forces of racism, injustice, capitalism, dominant power, et cetera, in order to keep that building in Black ownership and to keep it intact. You saw that everything around it was destroyed. It, was not, it has not been easy uh, uh, for this family to keep this space. It has not been easy for them to get resources, um, et cetera. And so in our role at the, the foundation, we're able to, to come in and 
through our grant making support, uh, this project, we, we gave a, it a $1 million grant to stabilize the building and, and to provide uh, for a community engagement process around thinking through collectively what the future uh, life of this black space can be for the black community today and in the future. Uh, but also broadly, again, for uh, the city and the society, because it's important that this space has been kept, even though it has seen uh, and experienced so much harm. I'm just going to breeze through because I see I'm, I'm at my time already. Um, uh, another kind of regional scale. Uh, so we've talked a lot about kind of individual buildings or sites, but we also think at multiple scales, this is the urban designer and planner in me, about our work, and we have to think about scale. And so in another important kind of space and landscape is the Gullah Geechee Cultural Heritage Corridor. Uh, this is a, a culturally and ecologically and environmentally rich region that spans the, the Southeast Atlantic coast, really North Carolina, all the way down to Florida and has some important uh, anchor cities like Charleston or Savannah. Uh, some of you probably know that there's a, a new African-American museum, uh, uh, Paycock Freed and Walter Hood, uh, working on this project in Charleston, which is uh, marking the site of, of the importation of uh, enslaved people from Africa and commemorating that history. And that's a project that Mellon um, uh, supported. But there are also a whole web of interconnected interrelated histories in this region, uh, like the Hutchison House, uh, where Henry Hutchison, who during the Reconstruction era, uh, you know, nearby uh, the plantation where he was enslaved, uh, he was able to build uh, this home during the Reconstruction era, an era that's kind of written out or, or uh, limited and marginalized in U.S. history, uh, where there was an active campaign to have a more just and equitable society for, for uh, uh, Black people, African American people, and so that there was this life uh, that was there. But Reconstruction sort of famously was compromised and and even undone um, uh, by Jim Crow and other uh, codes and and policies that that investment uh, was um, uh, sort of saw the declines that that reflected the uh, the the backward nature of of progress for Black people in the society at large. Uh, but people are working to reinvest in that place, uh, restore the home. Uh, and make it accessible uh, for public and, and as an acknowledgement of reclaiming history, reclaiming uh, power. Uh, but there are also other types of work uh, engaged. This is uh, Chef um, Michael Twitty uh, and Adrian Lipscomb uh, and, and others on the team who are uh, nearby uh, the International African American Museum and the Hutchison House in this kind of regional corridor. Uh, starting the Maloma Heritage Center, which will be an eco-friendly um, uh, heritage center that will serve as a connection to uh, the culinary and agricultural past of, uh, of uh, what they call the African Atlantic, right? The connection between uh, the culture and practices and knowledge of Africa as it was transported uh, to the United States with the enslaved peoples. Uh, and that has really stayed in many ways incredibly intact in that Gullah Geechee region uh, and corridor uh, of the U.S. And so this organization, Maloma, acquired there is sort of a symbolic uh, 40 acres of land, right? The kind of the promise of, of reconstruction that was, was for many not realized. Um, and acquiring that land and thinking about how they'll reinvest it as a place at this larger scale of land, environment, and stewardship and production. Uh, and so the Queen Mother, uh, uh, sort of one of the elders that's a part of this group um, that's uh, developing this project, noted that, quote, as we step foot on this sacred soil, we are reminded that we don't own the land, but that we are the caretakers of it, right? And so that shift, right, it's not simply, you know, we, quote, unquote, own the 40 acres of land, right? It's that the larger dominant structures require you know, participation in this thing called ownership, but that is not our attitude, right? We are only the caretakers of it, uh, and that they're going to be in that process of caretaking, making connections back to uh, the continent. They're, they work with uh, communities in, in West Africa, uh, Cameroon, Ghana, et cetera, uh, to talk about the food 
and cultural heritage exchanges that can be uh, brought uh, uh, to Carolina, but also from Carolina back uh, to Africa and building uh, community and power uh, along those lines. Um, so with that, I will end the presentation. Uh, and thank you for thank you very much. I really hope that this gives you a bit of a spectrum uh, of the range and the span of work uh, that we're developing, uh, which goes from uh, you know land back and land stewardship and questioning <laughs> land ownership in general uh, through to how we connect and relate a broader range of uh, cultures and stories. Uh, in our public spaces, and of course, as we are engaged in that as architects and designers. So thank you. Um, <clears throat> Justin, thank you for that beautiful talk. A lot of reason for um, hope and optimism and the ideas uh, that you showed us and the work you're doing with Mellon Foundation. So thank you. Um, <clears throat> we have, let's say, 10, 15 minutes. So <clears throat> let's open it up for a little bit of a round table with Cruz and Shelby for about 10 minutes, and then we'll take maybe a question or two from the audience. So Cruz or Shelby, you have anything you'd like to share? Yeah, thank you, Justin. It's, I could listen to you talk all day, so I, I wish that uh, we could keep going, but I think my question went back to your first quote um, from Fisher in Toronto about what it would mean to evolve the institution of education through the notion of caretaking because you're presenting these really amazing projects. And I think I can't help but wonder how the design, the design education needs to evolve so that it can participate better in these questions, particularly how it needs to elevate the humanities as the time where I see design education reorienting towards a STEM project. So I know that's like a giant multi-hour question, but if you just, if you, if you had something you could share on that. Yeah, it's a really important question. And something a little quick personal aside is that um, when I, uh, one, when I was an, an undergraduate student still, um, you know, we did, had our studio and our studios were in Savannah and Charleston. <laughs> It was like a little black kid going to stand in Charleston. There's Confederate monuments everywhere. And, and uh, the, you know, my uh, studio faculty, Paul Karyok was, was my professor. I don't know if any of you know him, but um, he has in his role as a studio faculty, actually for me as a student, provided a lot of space and room for me to actually deal with and address that and that it was valued and important that that, that I could have a space to talk about that as a student. So you know, I was a kid, basically, he is a professor, right? We had the, the work we were supposed to be doing. And there is a, a clear acknowledgement by the studio faculty that actually, we should be doing some other work. <laughs> right? And, and not like, you know, tear everything up and throw it away. But there was there, there was truly from the faculty level, an acknowledgement that we had to do other work. So we you know, we're reading bell hooks and stuff then long before that it was cool to do that, right? The, um, so that's kind of like individual faculty level. I think at the institutional level, there is a, a major structural problem that history, the humanities broadly are not well integrated into uh, uh, the curriculum um, in, in the, the architecture schools. And this goes to NAB and like what counts and like there are a lot of Kind of pieces to this, but um, I, I think there has to be a, a significant undoing of what the kind of the core skills and competencies of architects and designers are. Um, and especially if you go, if you get kind of future oriented in thinking with how technology has changed, how labor and practices and how the actual profession is changing, the schools are not doing a good job of training the future generation for the reality of, of practice or the reality of the ethical responsibilities of what it means to be someone in, involved in the built environment. And I'm not even gonna say kind of professional licensure, is anybody that is involved in how our world changes needs to have an ethical basis for what they learn, what they know, how they would practice. So hopefully, I mean, for students, like you can actively 
on your side, take things as elective and you can kind of create and shape your own. I think schools in the interim can create kind of tracks and do some work and labor of reaching out to other departments and kind of creating uh, sort of the connections and frankly make an interface for students to get what are really important skills. Uh, and then I'm also a part of uh, Dark Matter U. Uh, there has to be other and outside, and obviously Cruz with and Natalie with Loud Readers, right? There have to be spaces outside of those institutions that are able to to do some of that work as well until the institutions have have meaningfully shifted. But I mean, I would say for in in large part the the universities are not exactly where they need to be to do this work. Um, Last quick uh, personal story. When I started graduate school, Columbia um, uh, moved to New York in September 2001, and we all know what happened right after that. Um, and that semester, and this was like my kind of first uh, se semester architecture school, Columbia, uh, I took a seminar with Andres Hewson, um, which was a Mellon, like that seminar existed because Mellon funded his seminar. Um, and it was called Globalizing City Cultures. And the original premise of the of the seminar was how uh, power operated in, in public spaces and public realm in cities. Um, but because it was the 9-11 semester, and, it, and frankly, it was a, you know, there are a few of us architects in it, but most of the people were in the humanities. It was, it was the course was in the German comp lit department. Um, <laughs> but I learned more in the German comp lit department about space than I ever did in architecture. Right. And I went and frankly, I learned more in the German comp lit department about race and inequality <laughs> than I ever did in architecture. So th there, there's a lot that needs to be kind of put together to 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 give us the, the awareness and agency we need. Amazing. Uh, I want Want to follow up um, before we open to, to the students, um, and it, it's kind of funny because um, it's funny and really interesting because uh, we've been kind of exchanging and kind of working together and thinking together and participating in things. And I've been a beneficiary of many of the things that you're doing in many different aspects, even from being in Harlem, enjoying the music with my daughter in the street, right, and knowing that you have a lot to do with that. Um, and, and maybe my question is more about trajectory and strategy uh, because I, I feel like you're one of the most conscious speakers because uh, it, it's, it, it's, it sounds and it looks as if you plan everything really strategically like uh, working for the city of New York, uh, found, uh, being co-founder and co-director of so many organizations, uh, being a member of them like, like um, Black Space or, or uh, Dark Matter University, and, and, and now with the work of a, uh, that you're kind of like architecting, uh, if, if I can quote Kanye before he went crazy, uh, uh, <laughs> to, to talk about um, a program that is almost being formed by these ideas about how to create community, how to provide an infrastructure uh, that is real, like a material to all these initiatives. Uh, how, how do you understand, like, if you look at your trajectory, that those early steps, you know, the studios you were taking, you know, when you were in school, the things that you were asking, the things that were not answered for you, uh, um, and, and the path you take in that I think is quite unconventional, right? To be an architecture student that mm -hmm. ends up working for the government and then working for foundations and somehow being able to generate more architecture than we can all dream of in a way, right? Because uh, uh, those resources are sometimes so far away from us. So how do you see that relationship? And now, if, even if you look at your career in how have you been able on purpose, on purpose or, or accidentally to manage all these resources um, as a practice in a way? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really appreciate the question. And it's funny because the, um, um, you know, I think I mentioned, or I think someone mentioned in my bio, like I got the, the Arts and Letters Award. Um, and like that's like people like me don't get that, right? Um, you know, it's it's people that have the more conventional, um, I I would say, kind of individual, uh, individual accomplishment <laughs> frame, right? Like the the creator, the creative, uh, 
uh, person gets the the recognition in my practice has for a very long time been I would call it distributed practice. I do a lot of little things in different places that that add up to to a direction. Um, and some of that is just frankly my own personal background and lived experiences, like things that I've sort of seen and cared about and known and understood for a very long time and it just sort of accumulates. Um, over time that helps me decide, frankly, where and how I spend my time or not. Um, but the accidental part is I would say that I, I had a, a few very important kind of mentors that shaped my career over time. And Phil, <laughs> Phil knows this, uh, you know, very early in undergraduate. So I mentioned Paul Carioke. Paul Carioke at the time, his partner was Mabel Wilson. So when I was, you know, a sophomore in college, right, like Mabel was already an important uh, influence there in terms of language and contextualization that that was very present with me uh kind of move forward um and uh at Columbia was Moji Bartlu so uh, an uh, Iranian American and Persian um architect uh uh and she was incredibly influential uh in my career because that that's where the idea of kind of um, you know, I was using the term multitude today, but but the idea that uh, difference, <laughs> right, and complexity is something that is is a responsibility to be understood. And like she drove people crazy, frankly, because it, it was like more is more is more is more is more. Um, but that more is more is more became um, for me a, a skill uh, of pattern seeing, right that there could be a lot of different things going on and 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 in order to kind of connect the dots was something that I learned really at, at a formative stage for me um, to understand the the power in that, right? And so uh, kind of at that point in my career, like I was, you know, I was, I was working with her, but I was also working like in Bernard Schumi's office at the time doing like, Here's the star architect doing the signature project and, you know, beautiful design. And I love and care about all of that, too. But I found for someone like me that the power and agency was not there. The power and agency was in the network, in the in public, in a different set of responsibilities that still require design. Right. And then the, the third uh, kind of mentor was, um, you know, I graduated college had, you know, I could have gone to work as a quote unquote architect, <laughs> or I could have gone another direction. And I went um, to the city government uh, and I made the the choice to work for the people. <laughs> I could have gone and worked for an architecture firm where you work for rich and, and powerful people, or I could have gone to the city and I could work for the people. <laughs> and I mean, it, at the time, it was a very uh, kind of simple choice. Um, uh, and it's difficult because there, there are a lot of things that you have to do that are not what people are, are taught to care about in design school. I mean, people should care about those things in design school, but there was a misalignment at first. But the leadership at the planning department at the time was, you know, uh, Amanda Burden, um, who was planning commissioner at the time, like a design aware planning commissioner. And she had, and she never gets credit for this, but Amanda Burden had all these black and brown people hired <laughs> in in the planning agency, uh, and we had a lot of power because Amanda would give us the power that she had. So you know the big real estate developer coming in, and we're going to do this. You know, Rafael Vignoli, uh, rest in peace. But you know these sort of big figures would come in with their one directional ideas, and and we actually have power and agency to say this is not right for these communities because we've been going to community meetings every evening for, for weeks. And we know that there's a misalignment and we were, we had the power to do that. So I learned at a young, very young age that I had some power uh, and, and how it looked very different, differently from what I was exposed to in school and, and how I see the broadly the field of architecture and design working in its relationships to power. Um, and and it, it's it's something that the more that you 
kind of see the different arenas and experiences and, and levers, uh, I was able to work, I think, more and more effectively with it. And in my view, the, the, the most effective way to work with it is some form of shift or distribution uh, of, of the power dynamics when you see that they're extremely out of balance. And that is, I think, what drives a lot of my, my practice. Thanks for sharing that, Justin. I know a, a couple few people have had to drop because our afternoon studios are starting yes. here. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Sorry about that. No, so, it's uh, been fantastic. Are there any questions from the audience or who's remaining in the audience? Too many, too many for the last three minutes. Probably. Yeah. yeah. Okay, well. Um, Thank you so much, Justin. Yes, you're very welcome. Happy to to do it, and um, you know, I think the the you know, I think I mentioned this is you know, people like you all in places like Iowa State are really important spaces for these conversations and work, and so I wanted to carve out the time to to make sure to to participate with all of you and and what's an important conversation. We really appreciate.